Thank you everyone for joining our webinar, Allyship and Processing Being Black in America. I'm Jackie Ferguson and I'll be handling the logistics and facilitating the Q&A for our panelists. We want this conversation to be interactive, so we'll stop and take questions throughout the webinar. Feel free to drop your questions in the Q&A at the bottom of your Zoom screen at any time, and we'll try to answer as many live as we can. If you're referencing this webinar on social media, please use hashtag the diversity movement and tag us on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook. Now I'll drop out of sight and let our host take it from here. Kurt, the mic is yours. Jackie, thank you so much. Uh, a quick note about uh, the session today. We know that this topical area uh, is, uh, can be uncomfortable to discuss. And so it's important for us to make sure that uh, we lean into that. This is designed for us to challenge some of the things that uh, we may have been holding back in terms of comfort. And so while we're gonna delve into some areas that are sensitive, we also wanna make sure we're doing it in a respectful way. And so uh, make sure that if there are things that you wanna talk about, uh, you can always use the anonymous feature in Zoom. Uh, but at the same time, we want you to challenge yourself uh, to really engage in the conversation. Before we get started, I'd like everyone to um, do me a favor. And this is something that we've been thinking about probably all week, is how are you feeling? A lot of times we put aside how we feel, and this is the time for us to really delve into that and talk about that. So if you could in the chat, uh, if you could just express some of the things that you've been feeling this week, I know for, for a lot of us and for me personally, I've been on this, uh, this continuum from sadness to anger and kind of going and vacillating back and forth between sadness and anger. So would love to see um, how uh, people are feeling and just some things that are coming across the chat right now or frustrated, confused, scared, um, don't really know where to start. Uh, how can I make a difference? Uh, helpless, uh, overwhelmed, emotionally drained, sad, tired, uncertain how to hold space for others. And so I'm sure we could list many of these things uh, and they run the gamut in terms of, of how we've all been feeling. But there certainly has been this feeling of, of uh, just being tired uh, and, and getting to the point where just don't really know what to do next. And I think now, because we're at this moment, just looking at some of the, the feelings that folks are expressing uh, on the call today is that um, people are ready for what's next. And so uh, what I'd like for the panel to do now is to just based on your own perspective, based on the conversations you've had this week, just give, give us a, a summary of uh, Ex summary, summary expression of the, some of the things that you've heard and what you've been feeling as we think about what's happening in society overall. You want to go first? Uh, Dr. Stromling, can you start? Sure. First off, I want to thank you, thank Walk West, the diversity movement, for this opportunity to learn and share with you today. Uh, my feelings have run the gamut as well. Uh, everything from uh, anger and frustration. Uh, I'm not surprised though, because when you study this, when you study the history of our country being a very violent nation, starting with the Boston Tea Party, which was not a party, that we understand that this is how white supremacy, how structural racism, how these things play out. So we're not surprised. It is an atrocity, uh, but I definitely am motivated and inspired that the George Floyd atrocity, coupled with Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery and others, and ones that are even being revealed today that, thank heavens, we have social media and cameras. But we're moving to a movement. So to go from these, these incidents, these atrocities, and go to a movement, I'm very, very inspired by that. And so when you have a movement, you know, I think the way we've been socialized and conditioned is to ask, who owns it? Where are we going? What are the objectives? What's the game plan? But I think when movements have happened in our country in the past, they've been very organic, just like this. And so it's important for us not to try and put on the 
um, the constraints, um, the timeliness that things have to happen by a certain time. These certain people need to be in leadership. We need to know everything that's going on. That's not how effective movements happen. So I'm inspired by what is going on. I'm very, very uh, happy to see this all across the country. Tanya? Well, yeah, I mean, I'm echoing everything that uh, Dr. Stroman spoke about. And it's interesting because, um, you know, I've been ideating around how it must have felt for eight minutes and 46 seconds in what was what was those last moments for George Floyd's life and how I guess I'm trying to say this feels different and I can't imagine um, how when we talk about things that spark movements, as Dr. Strowman put it, how can we capitalize on something that is so horrific? And it's, it's almost like, um, I, I want to stay in the moment of thinking how George Floyd ended his life, how his life was ended, and have empathy for his family um, and what they're dealing with, but also not recognizing the burden that's now on their family in terms of speaking out and also catalyzing this where we're at right now. And so I am all over over the place and being extremely mad and emotional, but also trying to be strategic. Uh, we lost a life that's created movement. And you know it's 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 the conversations uh, hasn't been just within an echo chamber. Um, it hasn't been just with uh, the usual suspects of our community that have been organizing around diversity, equity, and inclusivity. Uh, I wish there was a way that we can capitalize and create un some type of technology that measures allyship real time. Because I suspect that allyship is at an all time level um, compared to the allyship that we've seen in the 60s. Um, and, and to me, you know, when we think about the science of implementing strategies, um, you know, we've had early adopters. If you think about a bell curve, you have folks that are already in the struggle. They're already standing beside you. There are communities that are pushing forward. Um, I feel like we are now getting to the crescent of folks that have been on the fence and getting at the folks that have been sort of maybe whether it be passive and being engaged or maybe just because of proximity. Um, you know, maybe the problem isn't in front of you. Now we understand that, um, you know, in order for change to happen, the folks that are unaffected have to be outraged. And hopefully through peer influence by getting the folks that are predominantly in the middle, hopefully by peer influence, the folks that are stuck in the mud, just by simple, by, by now we've shifted the culture that this is the norm. That's when we're really going to see some of the movement that Dr. Stroman is talking about. Yep. I mean, you know, for, for me, going through that period of um, anger, um, depression, because you, you look and you say, is this what we're dealing with at this time? But where I've landed personally and what is giving me joy and hopefulness is the sheer number of white people that are now starting to get it. The sheer number of people that didn't understand when Colin Kaepernick took a knee, that it had nothing to do with the flag, it had nothing to do with the military, it had everything to do with a single objective to shine a spotlight on police brutality towards African Americans. And that that mindset shift has now opened eyes when we look at an African American man that was murdered basically on live television. And unfortunately, it took a graphic representation of what we've been trying to say to shock the world into submission to the reality of what we face. And now that that reality is now available to the masses, people have the opportunity to decide. 
I am either for human decency or I am against it. And because that decision is now simple, it is not rhetoric based, it does not take hours to decide, because it is now simple, I am for human decency or I'm against it. There are many, many more of all backgrounds, ages, colors, sexual orientations, all of that, that are for human decency. And so what brings me hope and joy is now we have enough mobilization and enough, enough want to, to where now we can create some of that structural difference because we have a mass that can speak together as one on multiple platforms at the same time. And that organization, organic organization that Dr. Stroman talked about is really leveraging the internet. It is really leveraging video and all of the tools that have been used for negative. And that Twitter monster where everybody's a tough guy on Twitter can now be mobilized to create authentic voices for how we can treat each other better tomorrow. And that's the part that has me encouraged even in this moment of some anger and depression and fear about the future, there's enough of that light that is pushing out that, that gives me hope to keep pushing. I'd like to build on that and just say that it is uh, another statement on our country, as much as we have people who believe that it is great, that we have COVID-19 happening right now and the data is very clear and it's been reported by every media outlet that blacks, people of color are dying at a disproportionate rate. And so we have that as an example of the inequities are happening to certain people, but it takes a live video of one black man, as you stated, being murdered for people to awaken. That's a statement on America and who we are. So the question I want to ask is, unfortunately, this isn't the first time that a murder has been captured yeah. on video. Yeah. And so what is it about this moment that's different? Uh, you know, we've had Black Lives Matter as a, a, a movement for a while. But what, what is it about this moment that has made things feel different? I'll take this one, but I'll be brief and, and, and give the mic to, to our other panelists because I've thought a lot about this. The thing that's different is because we're trying to assign this movement to a single moment. And really, this is just the catalyst that has broken the dam yep. and that has put hatred on notice that hatred needs to run. That, that love and commitment is gonna rise up. So to me, it is not this thing being different or stronger. It is the fact that we had a, a global pandemic where people were in front of social media, TVs, and still, and then these things happened and there was nowhere else for people to go with that pent up demand, that emotion, that energy. And so it hit at a moment of time to create that explosion. And then it was almost like cataracts were lifted off people's eyes to now see all of the different things that had happened over the last six months, six years, 60 years, 400 years, mm -hmm. and that be in a different perspective. So I think it was a catalyst moment. So I take my faith everywhere. And so I'll take it from a spiritual perspective. I think it isn't, I definitely um, hear you, but I think it's God. I think that COVID-19 is here and it put people in a place where all distractions were removed. You can't go to the ball game now. You're not going to work. You can't go to your faith center, your church, your synagogue. You are isolated. And then these, again, we've seen them before. And then this happens. And this also explains, I believe, a number of people going to the streets. Just think how many people would be out there today if they weren't concerned about their health or if they were, their health would be compromised by being out there. Just think how filled the streets would be. This is great but this point. is almost like this setting took place at this time that's bigger than humans. It, it, was, it was designed this way. And so now, as always, we have um, Will, right? 
humans have will. So what are we going to do about this? Yeah. What will be that action with, within this movement? You know, I, I amen, first of all, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Stroman. And, you know, it's interesting. I tend to think about uh, my visual, when I visualize change, I think about the stock market. And, you know, all, albeit I feel like we are, you know, we are trending up. You know, we do have some divots there. And, you know, what's the difference in, 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 your, in your boiling point? You know, from 99 degrees Celsius to 100, you know, it's one degree that gets you to the boiling point. Um, there's books that speak to, you know, the, uh, the, the levers of your tipping point. You know, when you get to the place where it just overflows and it becomes uncontrollable. And whatever those factors are, you know, I still see it as an evolution of us moving and evolving and getting to another place. And so, you know, I, I, I take my, you know, my son, for example, 14 years old, um, and he is, he is not as impacted by this than I am. Um, and it's interesting because, you know, in his short life here, you know, for the majority of his life, he's had a black president and his worldview is a little bit different. And so when you're explaining it to him versus when I talk to my father and my mother who experienced protests on another level in the sixties, and they're literally, they cannot take it. They cannot have this conversation because of the trauma. They cannot see another black body in the street because it would then be a tipping point for them uh, to, 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 to regress. It would be a tipping point of them of done. There's another, another funeral that we have to preside over. And so, you know, it's interesting because it, it's a very subjective sort of analysis of what's going on. Like, what is, what is your trigger? But I will say the consistency that we're seeing in change, um, as most movements in this world, has been driven by young people. And these young folk have accelerated their ability to mobilize. They have accelerated and pressure the community to make a difference and to make a change. And their connectivity is on a level that's unprecedented. I mean, it, it, tru it truly is. We were having a conversation about historical movements, what would we had Twitter during the Alabama bus boycott? You know, what, what messages and how could we have convened the country to boycott a bus system? So, you know, it, it's a lot of different levers. And I think there's a, a, a real interconnection between what all of us have been saying. So the, one of the things that we've been talking about this week is the fact that <clears throat> a lot of times companies and organizations will not make a statement around things that could be perceived as being political, things that could be perceived as societal issues. And this, this has risen to the point that organizations uh, are having to make statements about what's happening. And so how do leaders start to understand what's happening, especially leaders that are white, and how, how can they help employees process, or how can they process and also help employees process all the things that are happening? So one of the things, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in on this one, <clears throat> you got to start where you can with what you've got. And so there's power in having an open ear and listening, right? So there's, there's a power in simply just having an open forum, a Zoom session with your broader team. But then there is even something more powerful for a CEO of companies of any type and size, taking three or four of their people of color and getting on a Zoom call, getting in a social distance setting and just say, I wanna hear what is on your mind so that I can be helpful in this moment to the best I know how. That humility, that empathy supersedes your knowledge about diversity and inclusion, your knowledge at the moment, because there's nothing that any CEO can do right now to fix this. So really it's about that empathy and openness. And then the second thing is to make sure you as a business leader and your leaders 
are fixing the educational gap around diversity and inclusion and having inclusive conversations. So one is that openness in the moment to be there as an individual, as a person, and empathizing with people that are hurting. But the second is to show an example in how do you educate you and your leaders so that you can be more productive of having this conversation be a long-term part of your strategy, not a Band-Aid hoping it will go away. And so I think those are two mindsets that, that I'm encouraging CEOs that I'm, that I'm talking with, kind of beyond the initial public statement um, and, and into that action mode. But you don't have to try to change the world tomorrow because this is going to be a marathon, right? This isn't going away. Uh, right. You know, there's, there's no pill. There's no 30-day uh, DNI diet, right, that's going to get you right. And so it's going to be a longer-term process. Dan, you want to jump in? See? Uh, sure. I'm, I'm, so, you know, I think it, there's been, um, and just to sort of restate the question a little bit, um, you know, when you have companies that have been, you know, really squarely focused on uh, their diversity, equity, and inclusivity work, and, you know, we created this uh, Triangle DEI Alliance, which is a way to convene um, support existing industries in their DEI journey. Um, you know, what we've seen evolve is folks are really trying to figure out how do we, um, you know, institutionalize this, um, you know, not making it an add-on. It has to be a must-have. And so we've sat on the intersection of uh, it's not only um, the, you know, it's not only good for business when you think about uh, having a diverse workforce, thinking about building culture, uh, but it's also the right thing to do. And within the, what the pandemic has done, as folks have been really ideating around concrete, increasing their uh, robust strategies, the pandemic became almost a, um, a test of will to not suspend the DEI values, to not suspend the work. Uh, because now it becomes a question of can we sustain it in this moment where we're having to triage what we do on every, what we do every single day when DEI isn't muscle memory yet, you know, when DEI is something that we're still trying to figure out and create metrics for and be and think about qualitative measures to be able to determine uh, do we have truly a culture that's inclu inclusive. So it's interesting because. Because, you know, I think the statements have been a reflection of folks saying, we're not there yet, but please understand that we, this is a, this is a value proposition for us. You know, this is important and we're willing, we're working on it. We're not there. We're recognizing that we're not there. And so, you know, to me at least, this is, this is, um, has been eye opening on several levels and the conversations have been incredibly with C-suite leaders across the country and within our region that are dedicated to push this thing forward more than anything else. So yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about the prospects of moving forward. So I would just add that, you know, there's that phrase that all PR is good PR. When something happens, you can spin things and take things forward. And, but I say for a lot, and I would say the majority of corporate leaders right now, this is not good because now you've been put on blast and you come up with the most perfect statement. And yet your employees, the people that you work, your partners, your donors, all of them are saying, wow, isn't that a bunch of bull? I mean, look at Nike who has, you know, an amazing reach, global. And a lot of their brand influencers are African-American elite athletes. And yet their statement, don't do it. Major pushback. And this is Nike. And so all of these corporations who have their pyramid and at the top of the pyramid, that C-suite, it's older white men. And then you're going to put out a statement saying that you support Black Lives Matters, and uh, we believe in diversity and inclusivity, and you know X Y Z. People are laughing. People are laughing. Employees are laughing. 
And so I'm inspired by those employees who, again, who have been awakened, who are organizing and saying, CEO, that's not what's happening right here in our company. And we need to really, you know, take a deep examination on your statement. Mm -hmm. And we need to change the culture here, right? Peter Drucker, um, what, the father of business management? Yeah. Culture eats policy for breakfast. So you can say all these things, you can put it down on a piece of paper and guidelines, guardrails and all of that, but the culture, it's not happening. It's not happening. And so whether this is from an individual basis or the C-suite, the leader speaking to uh, blacks, to people of color, the first thing I say is don't ask if we're okay because we're not okay. This is very heavy, but you should check in. You should ask, are you safe? right? Because we still have COVID-19 in the midst of COVID-16-19, right? So ask if we're safe. Check in, but don't ask the question if we're okay, because that takes us right back to that pain level. And then we have to find the energy, the, the confidence to speak it through to someone that we don't necessarily have a close relationship with. The other thing I would encourage is that you continue to give us space, that we're all processing this differently. Some of us are really emotionally charged. And so that macro ag aggression, I mean, is just amplified, right? And so I would say, just give us space. But right now, spotlight is on and we get to see whether or not you're really walking the talk. Mm -hmm. Right, so Dr. Sturman, I wanna follow up on that particular point. There's a question that's come in the Q&A that I think kind of strikes at the heart of this. Uh, so I'll read it verbatim. As a white male, I've been trying to speak up and voice my comments on social media. And for the first time today, I asked an African-American stranger how they were feeling and had an incredible conversation. I feel the best way to become comfortable with this approach is by speaking up and doing it over and over. Whether, what other suggestions do you have for people like me to make an impact? People like me. So there's a lot going on there. So we've got male, we've got uh, white, we've got someone who's active in social media. But I did uh, write an article and I've spoken quite a bit on what white people should do. And I'd like to share that with you. Uh, and of course, the assumption is that you care and you really want a unified and a healed nation, which is a big assumption. The first thing, um, it's ABC. A, the first is acknowledge the injustice. And again, you really have to have something deep rooted inside of you that's just off if you don't see the pain, the ugliness, the evil in what happened to George Floyd. So acknowledge that injustices take place across all systems, whether it's education, whether it's healthcare, whether it's criminal justice, whether it's transportation, whether it's media, there is an inequity where black people are having the worst outcomes across all systems. I wish I had time to unpack that further. The second is to Community organize. You can't do this by yourself. Due to the heaviness of it all, you'll get burned out, you'll get tired. You need data and perspective from other people so that you don't go off track. So you need the community organize. And in particular, I'm, I do really, really support Surge showing up for racial justice. It is white anti-racist. There are chapters all over the country. And if you are local, there's a chapter right here in our area. And then I would also say organizing against racism if you're in the Triangle region. There's a Wake chapter, Durham chapter in Orange County. It's oaralliance.org, organizing against racism. And the reason why I say all this, even though I know the word allyship, ally is out there, I don't use that language because oftentimes ally implies that you are standing behind or beside. And I believe that white people need to lead. They need to lead their tribe, their people, right? Of course we have to come together and this is a black movement, but white people need to lead white people. And so I say be a leader and don't be an ally. Um, so that is my message to white people. Uh, I'm encouraged again that so many more are awake um, but it's important for white people to be aligned with other white people. And sadly, and I think it is by design, we don't know 
the many, many white people, freedom fighters, anti-racists who, who died, who shed blood for a better way. I think we all know about John Brown, but we don't know, know about um, Reverend James Reed. We don't know about Viola Giozzi. Uh, we don't uh, know about uh, Daniel Myrick, uh, all of these white freedom fighters. Um, mm -hmm. And again, I think it's by design so that you won't feel inclined like, wow, there's somebody just like me who cared and who wanted a, a better way. Uh, so those are my thoughts, A, B, C. This question uh, is for Don, and it, it, it goes like this. We've had incredible courageous conversations with our teams and leadership over the past couple of weeks, and people are speaking up about their experiences. These conversations have helped our team not move on, but rather move forward and release feelings that have been stuck inside us for so long. For some of us, I think the big question is, how can I become comfortable with the uncomfortable? So it's a big question. And, and that is a question that you answer, whether it is losing 30 pounds, whether that is DNI, whether that is race issues, whether that is learning a new language, doing something that is new for the first time requires repetition. It requires you to engage in an activity or a set of behaviors until they become second nature. It's a foundation of any type of learning. And so what I recommend when I'm trying to learn anything new, and I'll use myself as an example, uh, about a year ago, I started doing more speaking and was more vocal on diversity and inclusion, my walk as an African American in tech, the fact that I went 20 years in technology selling at an enterprise level and never sold to a decision maker that looks like me. Mm. And I decided, I said, how am I gonna be impactful? I have my story, my perspective, but I have to be and no more. Mm. So I started to read. I went and got specific training and became a certified diversity executive which is a three hour course, a project, a um, 500 page manual. I basically went back to school in an area that I understand from my experience, but I did not understand as a practitioner. Mm -hmm. So in order to be effective in, in, in practice, I had to do my homework. And then I also had to create a network like the folks on this panel, Danya Perry, Dr. Stroman, we've all had conversations outside of this moment where they have poured into me so that I could be more effective in my lane in this movement. And my lane is talking to C-suite leaders, to executive teams and coaches, because I can link the bottom line of the business to the moral imperative of this movement so that they can hear me because the bottom line is what's gonna get them fired or promoted or a raise. And if you can link a movement to the money, you can get people that can hear you and then they'll follow along the other places. So my advice to answer the question is, think about it in the same way that I did. You won't have the same journey, but commit to personal education, create a network of people that will teach you and mentor you because you're gonna have gaps, things you don't understand, but you don't have to wait to be perfect to make progress. And that is the most important thing that I share with anyone. You, from right where you sit, you can figure out an action plan tomorrow that you can make, make progress. For example, let me give a very specific example. Dr. Stroman mentioned an article that she wrote. You're listening to her on this webinar and she's amazing. Get that article and make sure 25 of your friends, 100 of your friends read that article. That you made a difference in that single moment. There's a couple, Penn and Kim Holderness, that are influenced. They're influencers. They have over a million people that follow them on their video channels and different things. They said, Donald, Jackie, we don't know exactly what to do. Can you come on our show and help our audience? They didn't know exactly what to do or say, but they pulled from someone else's expertise. They used their microphone, and we started to make a difference tomorrow. And so there's simple things that we can all do to, to, to push forward. And so Dr. Stroman, if you would make sure we have available a link to that article so that we can push it out, 
um, on all the channels that we have available and send it to the participants. I think that's, that's something that we can all do. In the diversity network, the last thing that I'll say, we don't have all the answers. Our foundation at the diversitymovement.com is to bring experts to bear on the problem at hand. We will learn and be capable in some things, but we wanna bring a powerful network of leaders so that we can be there in that moment, be they white, black, it, it, it doesn't matter. If you're down with helping, we're down with helping you have a microphone. In my passion talking about ACT, I failed to give you the T, which is take heed, <laughs> take heed of the past. And so as Don mentioned, it's important to do your work and to understand how people got situated where they are today. And uh, by taking heed of the past, you'll understand the, um, the complexity of structural racism. And one of the best books, uh, and I read a lot of books that's now in my top five is Richard Rothstein's The Color of Law. And mm -hmm. if you've not read that, that is a required reading, The Color of Law by Rothstein. I'll snap on that one. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give one snap, meaning I'm going to read it. Have I ready? <laughs> I'm ready. Right, I gotta get it. I can't do two snaps till I, till I get right. it. Add it to uh, the list of resources for sure because we, we can't learn enough about the topical area. Um, this question is for Danya. Uh, as someone of color who is not black, I'm trying to encourage other communities of color that I belong to that learning about the racism facing the black community is not just for white people to learn about. How do we message to other non-Black communities of color that they play a role and need to lead as well? That's a great question. And I, I have a lot of conversations about, you know, folks who sort of think about, is this conversation just solely for one of our marginalized groups? Um, but how can we make sure that we're uh, creating a space for, you know, for the voices of all marginalized groups? Uh, to be able to share and share and, and, and be able to express that this extends beyond. But, you know, we always try to fall back on what the data tells us in terms of who's impacted disproportionately. And I think that's important to note that, you know, a lot of our energy goes into typically, it, a lot of it is more about numbers. Uh, but if we can start to show parallels and understand sort of the schema of how we all, all had different lived experiences, and recognize that, you know, I, 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 you know, there's this adage that rising tide raise, raises all ships, you know, well, you know, it's interesting, but everybody's ships aren't seaworthy. And so we need to make sure that the, that everybody's ships are seaworthy as we all sort of elevate and it's create this space for inclusion that really does tap everybody's humanity. And it's not just about one specific subgroup, you know, it, 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 it truly isn't the movement and, and, and the, the, the link that you've seen in every movement has been a cross section of the community coming together to say that we have to push this issue from women's suffrage to civil rights. I mean, it doesn't matter. We've seen that. Um, so, you know, we don't want to be scared away. And there's going to be a narrative out there that tries to create divides. We're seeing it. We're experiencing it. And people are trying to create silos that is almost like this is just about Black lives mattering, you know. When somebody screams black lives and your response to them is that well, all lives matter, then you're ultimately saying you are silencing the pain that that person is expressing. And so, you know, again, I don't want it to be a counter narrative where we're almost making it very exclusive in our opportunity to make, you know, some true inclusion to be able to support humanity of what this perfect union that we all sort of been, been <laughs> you know, been ideating over for years. So that's just my take on it. Kurt, I've, I want to add something real quick. If you think about the most powerful vehicle, a Lexus or Mercedes, they're powerful in brand, they're powerful in engine, they're sleek, the tires, everything in that car has been designed for greatness with every part and component, how it was built, how it's warranted, how it was tested. And then that company then says, this is a flagship model of our vehicle. We can't be great as America when our components aren't great. Mm. 
And so what we have to think about is what does being great mean? And that means that all of the different components within the United States of America have to have the ability to operate at optimal efficiency. And so it's when you think about our country and you've got a very sizable component of that country, people of color, that are not able to operate freely. That holds back the entire country. And so if we want to talk about greatness, then what we have to do is make sure that all of the different elements of our society have the tools that they need, the support they need to operate at that excellence, and then we can be great. I think America has the capacity to be great. Right now, I think we're spending most of our time as a country defending our false facade of being great instead of spending that energy with looking inside and saying, this is what we need to do to be great. And that doesn't mean I don't love my country. That just means just like my children, I have to discipline my children when they don't do right. I still love them. I still have great love for my children, but their behavior is not great in that moment and that has to be corrected. So we have to correct some of these things so that we then can achieve that greatness a few generations from now, because we got a long road, but that's kind of the way that, that I look at it when people are saying, make America great again. I don't know a period of time America has been great for black people, right? I've not studied as much as Dr. Strong, but I don't know when that date is, right? I've not seen that, that data or information, but I do believe that we can be great. And that's one of the things that gives me hope. <clears throat> Don, just to follow up on that, and this, this is open to the panel, but I want you to start answer, with the answer to this question. And it's, it's, it's timely because it feeds into what you're saying. As a current black MPH student, I've had some white professors ask me what they can do. It bothers me because structural racism is a driver of health disparities. As a student, I look up to them for knowledge. However, I refuse to educate them. How should I navigate the situation? So one of the things I can relate to is you have to decide, and this is my opinion, what your role is. Yes. Okay. My role, if I'm in a board meeting for a department at a major university and there's 25 other members on this board and I'm the only African American, and then I get the culture questions, I can either say that's my burden to educate them, or I can say that's my opportunity to be influential. And what I've decided, again, personally, is I've decided not to have any chip about the educational component and use every opportunity that somebody asks with a, with a wanting and a teaching spirit, that they're open, that they're truly open, to have that cup of coffee, to share my perspective, to build a new bridge, to activate and build my, my network stronger so that my phone is ringing at moments like this, that I can be a voice to push it forward. And I understand how this, the, the listener is saying, that bothers me, that burden. I think we have to teach people to rise above it so that we use those moments to teach and, and push and prod and hold people accountable to do things better because we have relationships with them. And so I do look at that a little bit differently and it's difficult. It's difficult being in a room of 350 executives and you're the only one. It's difficult going to these golf country clubs and different things where he's having these major business events and you walk in and, and it's one, two, three of us. We all see each other. We give the head nod, but like there's so few of us, but I take it as a responsibility and I lean into it and I'm glad to be there so I can bring other people with me the next time. So Don shared the perspective of a peer to peer, always take advantage of an opportunity to teach and to share. And so being an academic and understanding that dynamic of a professor into a grad student, that's very challenging. And it is a burden that you should not have to um, address. And so you have to be concerned about your grade, right? Because people are human mm -hmm. and so I would open up with, I'm glad that you're interested. I'm, ex you know, I want to help you, but I'm learning too. And so what I suggest is that I know someone who could assist you on the faculty level. 
So I don't know what school you're at. I'm at Gillings at UNC Chapel Hill, the School of Public Health. And so you say, you might want to talk to Dr. Stroman. Or if you're at another university, that's why it's important to network and have favorable relationships so that you can make these referrals. Uh, but that is something, you're there to learn your particular degree, and you are not there to teach uh, a faculty member, and especially around race and racism. Far too often we treat this, this disease, this COVID-1619, like it's anything else. We'll listen to that crazy uncle at, during the Thanksgiving dinner. We will listen to coworkers at the water fountain, and then we go off and spew whatever they said versus honoring it. Um, I mean, you wouldn't have a surgery from a physician who had not taken a biology class or done their residency, but we'll just listen to anybody around race and racism. And so um, I, I'm sorry that you have to go through something like that, but because the, the country is awakened now and many white people are curious and they want to help and they want to do more, they're just asking anyone. And knowing that you have lived experiences Odds are you have lived experiences, they're reaching out to you. And so with a smile on your face as much as possible, say that's great, I'm learning too, uh, but I think it's you know helpful if you talk to X, Y, Z person. Yeah. Great answer, that's, uh, that's mm -hmm. a good point. That's really good. That's good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Stroman, this one is for you and we'll start with you, I think this uh, you know, certainly you and Don can take a crack at this question as well as Donya. I'm an employee at a company where our executive team is truly committed to shifting our culture and embraces making a more diverse workforce. They put out a Black Lives Matter statement, and I do think they believe it. That team is all white men. What can I do to be, what can I do to help be part of that cultural shift? So once again, they're on blast. So we got to respond. <laughs> In some ways, not that I would ever defend uh, white men with power, okay? <laughs> but I do feel their, their pain in the sense that if they don't put out a statement real fast, you know, something's wrong with you. And then if they decide, you know, to be a little pensive or a bit more thoughtful or to put it out real fast, then they run the risk of you got it all wrong. So mm -hmm. I, I state that as well. But this is an opportunity, again, to not make people feel guilty. Uh, this isn't about shame or blame. Those emotions never really get us anywhere. But it is a time to say, Am I allowed to be a part of this change? If it means that they're going to set up a task force, if it means that it's going to be behind scenes that you get to have uh, a cup of coffee or you know a beverage with one of the executives, but ask them, and not in a way where you call it out because they can they can see it that everybody around them in that boardroom is white white male, but ask can you be invited into this because your experiences and what you've learned. Uh, might be helpful to this. Um, and I'm not sure where you are in terms of position at that corporation, uh, but it might mean going up one level, one level, one level to get to the C-suite. If you are close to the C-suite now, I say it's your responsibility to do it. And if it, is, if it is a confident, bold white man, they will welcome you and say, thank you, right? So, um, I would take the initiative and try and see if you can get involved and be a part of these uh, decisions that are going to be made. Yeah. I don't really have a lot to add on, on that point. I think that's the, the right way that I would go about it. Also, the one specific is the how can I be helpful, right? Mm -hmm. Because any kind of task force or initiative need all types of people and perspective is, if they're really committed to it working. Yes. And so the how can I be helpful question gets in the dialogue of, what that task force is going to do, what the C-suite is going to do is their next step. And then the other thing is, it's a great question if you need to manage up, it's, it's how are we tracking what we're doing to know that if it's working or not. Mm -hmm. And that simple question, just done in a, in, from a point of humility, will again give that framework that we have to come back to the statement the plans, the execution, and then that measurement. And so if you're one of the folks in the organization that they know is going to start watching and holding accountable, 
you're going to get some action items of how to participate. <laughs> One thing I just want to add is make sure in your ask that you put it in writing. Corporation is around documentation. Put it in writing that you kindly want to be involved. And you know what's interesting, you know, and this is just experiential and just within the last uh, month, <clears throat> folks, uh, we're seeing companies that are, that have been working on their diversity and inclusion and, 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 and building bridges of equity. Like this, this, this work has been really evolving, especially within this region. So it's the connecting the, the statement that was made that folks, whether because of peer pressure or, you know, whatever it was, but the, the need to make a statement to the strategy. And so what we're wanting to make sure, and this is the accountability part, and let me lean in when I say this. Don't make a statement if you're not ready to do the strategy, right? Don't do it. Because this is really where you're going to be called out. So, you know, understanding that the companies that we have been working with and ideating around that are creating strategies and trying to figure out how to engage, you know, now this statement and this, where we're at now is going to accelerate it. And so the fear is, and the conversations that I've been having with folks that are creating and curating their statements, understanding that they reached out to me because they had already been designing strategies. They've already been working on strategies is the fear of missing something. You know, it's the fear of retreating back to making exclusive decisions, making top-down decisions, where they are looking at it like this because of the because of the impetus of the moment, wanting to seize the moment, and we sometimes, with muscle memory, go back and retreat back into something that's less inclusive. So again, you know, I would lean on the levers that your company has in place um, if they are indeed pushing the inclusion. I would imagine. If they made a statement, there has to be some level of strategy, regardless of how robust it is. But lean in on those opportunities and to figure out how can we actualize the statement that was made. And also, obviously, from my standpoint, um, you know, being forthright with your feelings um, and being willing um, to be bold in making statements about the statement when there are opportunities to ask questions about the strategy being comfortable and bold enough to say, where are we with this? I think those are all important for you to also push in uh, to make sure that you can be a part of that process. Thank you for that. That's motivated me. I think I might work on an article this weekend on how to check your corporate uh, statement and strategy because <laughs> everybody's watching these statements come out and go, what? So. <laughs> no, absolutely. And, and, and there's actually somebody tracking uh, mm -hmm. statements that are being made by corporations. They're tracking so that, because, because the point is, let's see who you should, should or should not support based upon their statement towards this. Right. And so there's a level of this global uh, accountability that you're seeing that again goes back to, to me, and I'll just tell you that within our regional business community, those that have been pushing d and and focusing work on equity, there's been a very authentic and sincere approach and push towards this. I'm really interested in the statements that are made with hollow intent. I'm really interested to see where those companies, whether they are going to be called out, uh, when folks are going to push up and see. I mean, and, and we don't know. Uh, but I will say that there, you know, our, I felt like since HB2, our communities have had such a, 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 an amazing sort of um, a desire to try to figure it out, understanding that we're not there yet, but just trying to figure it out. But I would say that in times like this, where everyone is awakened and motivated, some people need the tools to know how to, um, you know, investigate their statement, their company statement. Uh, I think most people get up every each and every day and they go to work and then they go back home and they get up and go to work and they go back home. And now all of a sudden you have this in your face. You don't like the atrocity. You're upset about how, you know, this is so inhumane. And then I have to get up and go to work and what do I do? And so it, it's our responsibility, or at least I'll speak for myself, 
that if I do have some tools that I've learned, that it's important to share and give people the tools so that they know how to speak to their HR or their manager or whomever. And, and again, it's, that's about that organizing. Organizing just doesn't happen. Yes. It's actually a skill set. Yeah. It's a skill set. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna break in here. We've got about a little more than five minutes and there are a few questions that are coming in. So I'm gonna bundle a few of these and I just wanna let everybody know who's participating that if we don't have an opportunity to answer your question live, uh, we'll answer this in a, a text Q and A later because I think it, everybody deserves to have answers to the questions that they've put forth. And so we wanna make sure that we do that and there may be an opportunity for us to have another session like this one. Uh, so there, well, let's tackle a couple of questions that are similar. Uh, so this starts with, I've tried to switch the conversation in my head with others from am I a racist to how does racism show up in my life? How have I perpetuated racism and what can I do differently? Do you think this is a helpful switch to make? And then what I would add to that question is folks who have folks in their network or their circle that don't have the same belief system and they uh, are uncomfortable with what other white people might believe. So their beliefs may be that they agree with the, the ch things that are happening in terms of trying to do something about them. And so that's a, a pretty large question, but I, I wanted everyone to kind of spend a minute tackling that, that issue uh, starting with Dr. Stroman. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> oh, yeah, man. <laughs> yeah, so everybody, everybody was jumping in. <laughs> so the first one is about racism and racists. Uh, that definitely takes a lot more time. Everybody has their own definition of racism and racist. And so you need to find yours. You need to craft one that works for you so that when you're in these conversations, when you're in meetings and you're collaborating, that everybody has their understanding of what these words mean. And that in itself is an action step. Even if it's just with your immediate family, your close network, how are we going to define this? Because if you keep this to yourself, you have no idea how people are taking things. For me, it's about system and institutional power plus race prejudice. Operative word, power, power. And so if you can influence my actions, if you can influence my community, my, my people, then you're a racist. Now, in other circles, in other situations, people will use racist to trigger where it might be just a bias incident or some type of discriminatory incident, but they will use racist, they will call a white person a racist because we know that person knows it triggers you. Yeah. And so understanding again, language that's very, very important. I wish I had more time <laughs> on that one, uh, but yeah, understand how do you define it and then making sure the people that you spend the most time with, everybody understands how you define it and how it, how it plays out. Uh, I think the other question is around what if your friends are, you know, having those other type of feelings about this? Well, I know what's going on in Facebook, at least for the past two or three years around race and racism. Unfriend, 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 because now people's character is coming out. Mm -hmm. and whether you can consider it, you're not human. You're not lifting up dignity of all people. In fact, you're actually ugly and mean. And Facebook is supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be a learning space. It's a way to connect with people back from elementary school. And you're messing up my joy. So unfriend. And so you might have to take that same type of attitude with some friends. Right. Because if truly, if they were your friends, then again, character, I don't know you at all but I would think you would want to lift up equity for everybody. And if you're keeping time and space with a person who doesn't want that, I don't know. I, it just doesn't work for me. No. Unfriend. Hey, Dr. Stroman, I, I am, I, <laughs> I love that. Unfriend. Mm -hmm. um, I am, I am, I am a glutton for punishment and, and, and I have taken the approach of, of keeping the friend, you know, to be able to bring them closer into the conversation. Um, and I will say, 
um, um, it's a struggle, um, you know, to have that conversation, especially when somebody is willfully. Um, but then there's a so some folks that there's some kind of cognitive dissonance, you know, this, they're just disconnected to a reality. And, and so I've, I've had some amazing conversations, uh, some transformational conversations, and, 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 and I try not to make them public. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll send them, I'll, as the kids say, I'll get into their DM, I'll slide into their DM and, 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 and say, you know, hey, I saw you mention this, uh, you know, can we meet for coffee or I'm open, I would love to talk to you about it. This is how I perceive it. And, and those conversations have really led to folks either saying, wow, I didn't, I, I didn't realize it or, you know, I was just joking and didn't mean, it. you know, and so sometimes, you know, it's, it's sort of like, you know, it's, it's the burden is on me, right? And I, and I know that seems very unfair. The burden is on me, but I am, again, willfully, I am a servant. Uh, no no apologies. Everybody has a role in this. And so if you want to give me your special mobile number, so when I get those people, I can forward them to you. Right? But, you know, hey, he can have mine too. Yes, everybody's got time. I believe that there are more people out you there who, who get it, who want to get it, and yeah. all they want is just another seed. They just need another kernel. Yeah. I got it. But yeah. I don't have time and energy to devote to people who are, uh, no, this, I'll, I'll pass them on to Donya. You got them. No, no, please. I, I, need, I, need to, I need to stop you guys there. We, this, this is a fantastic conversation. And so we know who to send our folks that we're tired of talking to. We send them to Donya. If you want to cut them off, send them to Dr. Stroman. Um, and so <laughs> Dr. Stroman, just a, a note from the panel. Uh, one of the participants said, you're an inspiration to all of us, and I feel honored to hear and see your passion. So know that you're your work is not in vain. So I will say I in 20 seconds, for whether you're white and you're trying to figure out what you can do next, or if you're black trying to fight, or a person of color trying to fight within your organization, in 20 seconds, tell them what, what they can do. Starting with you, Dr. Stroman. Like, what would you leave no, somebody I with as your summary statement? You know, can I share my screen real quickly? I think so. Let me see if I can... But I, I'd say, you know, it's, a, it's about hope. You know, we can make a better nation, as Don said. We can do this. This isn't something that, um, you know, is impossible. If we all have the will and focus on impact. Are we ready? Yep. Okay. Here Go it is. Wait. So this is one of my favorite slides that I use. Can everybody see that? And so <laughs> this is us. You know, and if we want to um, imagine and that white people are at the top of the boat smiling, sure glad the hole isn't at our end. And this is blacks and indigenous and people of color. You know, this is what's going on. You can't sit there and say, ah, you know, see ya. You know, black and indigenous and brown people turn around and point back to white people and say, yeah, see you later, right? And so I think, we're at a time where we're finally seeing our common um, humanity and we all want to make a better way. And so jump on the train, jump on the train. It doesn't matter where you start, just get on the train. And so I'm very, very blessed and honored to be with you today, uh, working with all people, all people. That's what it's gonna take, so thank you. So we gotta, we gotta leave it there. So uh, on behalf of, uh... Dr. Stroman, Danya, Don, you know, we thank everybody for joining the, the panel today. Hopefully you took some great stuff away. I know uh, this was very helpful and enlightening for me personally. Hopefully everyone got that same benefit. And so uh, if you want helpful resources, we're gonna continue to follow up this conversation and answer some of the Q and A's that came in. So visit the diversitymovement.com. The recording is gonna be made available uh, via email. And so we'll share that as well. Uh, thank you for all being here today. Uh, and we really thank you for taking the time out of your day because I know folks are doing other things, but this is an important conversation. And so thank you for showing up today to spend some time with us. And again, with that, thank you very much and see you the next time.